gave this to the young lady. I want to thank my family for joining us during their wonderful welcome. We stayed up last night doing that. One day I'm going to get my daughters to sing for me. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this day, for this hour, for this message. We ask you now, Father God, that your Holy Spirit might rain down on this house. That everything we say, everything we think, everything we do might bring you honor and glory. No one came here to hear me, Father. They came to hear you. And so we just say, speak, Lord. Speak loud. Speak clear. Let us leave this place, new people. And we promise to give you all the honor and all the glory because you're the only one worth. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk today about a fairly serious issue, at least to me. And I, I want to thank Elder Clark for her prayer because it sort of works perfectly with my sermon. I hope that this sermon will do for you what it did for me, and that is make you mad and make you go home and say, I'm going to do better. We get so caught up in Christmas and the Christmas season that sometimes we forget that Christ is part of Christmas. Much of the Bible we put into a lockbox and we only bring out during special occasions. But the Bible is so full of stories and subjects that have application all year long, but we, we only look at them rarely during specific seasons. And so today I want to look at the birth of Christ for its meaning for us for the rest of the year. And I want you to remember that Jesus the baby was also Jesus the Savior. And we shouldn't ever forget that. Now usually I tell y'all I'm going to do a short sermon, and I am. We'll be out by three. <laughs> All right, 2.30. <laughs> I want to start out with a poem I found by uh, Stan Lindsay of the First Christian Church. "'Twas a night before judgment, and all through the town, every creature was stirring and running around. The movies we went to were filling our heads with visions of playboys, Nazis, and the living dead. With mom in her miniskirt and dad in his slacks, we were drinking our liquor and smoking our packs. The children were gone to some pot-smoking bags so we jumped in the car, but the beer made us crash. Lucky for us, we lived through the wreck. Too bad for the other guy, but hey, what the heck? Let's watch a scary movie on Netflix without a second thought. Who cares that it introduces us to the occult? We will watch all the bodies get mangled and maimed. What a thrill, what excitement that each person died. So now for dessert, we'll watch Tales from the Dark Side. Just forget about Sodom on this Judgment Day. Let's all join the movement to liberate the gays. Turn on the TV and watch them strut. It's called Alternative Lifestyle. Let's all go to church, leave our Bibles at home. We'll just talk about the problems of Vatican Rome. Let's give our opinions of what's good and bad and get into an argument and all go home mad. We'll spend our last hours, our last hours destroying, destroying God's church, but it looks like the other man's fault from our perch. We left the church because we just couldn't agree. The right one was you and the wrong one was me. So back to our orgies, tobacco and beer. But wait, is that thunder outside I hear? It's probably a storm, so don't get excited. My God, all the stars in the sky have collided. It's getting much hotter. Our fevers are high. But a God of love surely won't let us die. But up in the air, I believe that I see a great crowd of people he loved more than me. I told him I loved him and was even immersed. I wonder how he knew I loved myself first. I finally yelled at the top of my lungs, you gave me no warning when you would come. But I heard him exclaim ere he rose out of sight, I told you I'd come like a thief in the night. Today, I want to spend just a few moments from the subject, no room for Jesus in here. Take your Bibles and turn with me to our scripture that was read so well this morning. Luke chapter 2, looking at the first seven verses. Luke chapter 2, looking at the first seven verses. 
When you have it, let me hear you say amen. Look left, look right. When your neighbor has it, let me hear you say praise the Lord. All right. Bible says in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a, cert, that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census, census that took place while Quinius was governor in Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her first son, she wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Here we find a familiar story. We can almost recite it from memory. The problem is we never look at the story for its application for our lives today. The story is so unbelievable that it almost immediately causes people to come off the fence on the issue of Jesus. From the beginning, it takes faith to believe in Jesus. What a remarkable story. You have to keep in mind that neither Joseph nor his daddy actually believed that Holy Spirit story. I can imagine old Joseph standing there pulling on his beard, trying to make himself believe the story that his fiance was telling him. The story was so outlandish that he just could not believe that anyone would try that on him. Everyone had been so proud of him finding such a nice, sweet girl like Mary. Everyone was just gushing about this lovely girl who was so nice, so honest, so pure, it, that the Bible even referred to her as the Virgin Mary. Mary was reared in a good family. She read her Bible every day, studied her Sabbath school lesson. She believed in all the things that, that Joseph believed in. She was a very peculiar girl. Joseph had recently asked her hand in marriage, and she was so pleased, and she accepted. Now, just a, a little while before they were to be married, she comes to him with this half-cocked story about a Holy Spirit impregnating her. How dumb did she think he was? How stupid did she think he could be? What, did she really believe he was going to believe some story about some Holy Spirit impregnating her? I can almost hear him saying, oh, you, 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 you're taking me for a fool now. First you go out and get pregnant, but then you come back with this silly story about some Holy Spirit. Joseph was an honest man. So he decided instead of just busting her, he would quietly let her go. However, the Holy Spirit sent an angel who confirmed Mary's story. Now the Bible gives us a Reader's Digest version of what happened, but I'm sure that Joseph was, if he was anything like me, he's probably the only person in the world who actually understood the birth of Jesus. That angel would have to come back three or four times <laughs> to talk to me. But Joseph was a different brother than me. Now, I want to be discreet because there had been something about Mary that at least caused Joseph to at least consider the possibility that just maybe she might be telling the truth. If you look at the story, Joseph seems to be sticking around listening to her explanation. There must have been something about Mary's personality, something about Mary's character, something about Mary which caused Joseph to at least consider the possibility that Mary might be telling the truth. Somewhere in the back of Joseph's mind, he must have believed at least part of Mary's story because Joseph knew this girl and how innocent she was. He must have considered that she may have really had something strange happen to her. Now, I'm not saying he bought the whole Holy Spirit story, but I'm saying that he stuck around long enough to at least let her explain herself. The Bible says that he tried to put her away privately. That means he doesn't want to embarrass her. 
to me, that tells me that he at least thought there's something more to the story that I missed. For some people, because we know their reputation, God could have sent a legion of, of angels and they still wouldn't have believed the Holy Spirit. Spirit. But now, because of Mary and the way Mary carried herself, Joseph knew there must be something different about this. And he stuck around and he listened to the story and he allowed the Holy Spirit to change his mind. You know, God speaks to us in different ways. And Joseph had a mission. Elder Dawkins, Dawkins always talks about his assignment. But Joseph's assignment was to help raise this young child. And he was to help raise him with this young lady, this young woman. And so his assignment that was to help raise God's son in human flesh. You can't even imagine the abuse this brother took. Mary, Joseph married Mary even though he knew she was pregnant. Joseph still was a good father even though he knew that Mary came in pregnant. Joseph still stuck by Mary even though Mary was pregnant. I can imagine the looks that he got when he went to the barber shop. As people whispered, man, you don't really believe that, do you? Can you imagine the looks he got as he shot that poor at Publix and, and Bilo as the people say, eh, Joseph's a fool, man. But there's a lesson in this. There's a lesson that God may ask you to do things that do, that does not sound, that do not sound rational, but it's your job to do them anyway. Sometimes you might be talked about. Sometimes you might be criticized. But the reality of it is, if you're doing God's will, don't worry about that. So Joseph took Mary and he married her. Joseph now, after all of that, now he's got this message that comes to a text that comes to him from the government saying you got to take your wife eight and a half months pregnant and y'all got to uh, walk or, or take a trip on a camel's back so you can register for the census. I'm sure that he probably put a lot of blankets and cushions on the donkey trying to make the ride as comfortable as possible for Mary, but it was a long ride on the back of a donkey. I'm sure he probably traveled slower than the other people trying to protect his young bride and his, and his young son. And so he traveled slow so people passed by him and they got to the where they were getting before he got there. Finally, after an arduous journey, they reached Bethlehem. I know they were tired. I'm sure they were hungry. After such a long ride, Mary was in pain and agony and all they want to do is find a soft place to lay their heads. I don't know what Bethlehem was like, but it probably had big signs saying Hilton over here, Howard Johnson over there, and all the nice hotels all over the place. You know, when you're traveling, there's nothing better to stop and get into a nice hotel bed and sleep after a long day of travel. As they traveled towards the Hilton, they saw other hotels and they slowly began to knock on the doors of the hotels asking, excuse me, do you have any vacancies? One after another, door after door, they heard the same familiar refrain. We don't have room for you in here. Imagine that. These people are telling Mary and Joseph they have no room for Jesus. What do they mean they have no vacancy? Can anyone be so busy, so tied up in their lives that they don't have room for Jesus? Can anyone be working so hard? Can anyone have such a tough job, have such a tough family that you don't have room for Jesus? How can you be so booked up, hooked up, or shook up that you don't have room for Jesus? Who 
or what can be so important that you can't make room in your life, in your house, in your job, on your job for Jesus? How can your life be so cluttered that you don't have an empty corner where you can put Jesus? Today I want to talk about three things that, the, that crowded Jesus out of those people's lives. First, the first reason they had no room for Jesus was because they were crowded. There are some people whose lives are so crowded that they just don't have time for Jesus. They're just too busy taking care of all the many things they have to do. They just don't have time for Jesus because they have, because they got to go to school or maybe they got that second job or maybe they got that third job. You know they got to pay for that nice house. You know they got to pay for that second mortgage. And so their lives are so busy, they just don't have time for Jesus. They're busy keeping up with the Joneses. And they can't keep up with the Joneses and make time for Jesus. Some don't have time for Jesus because they're just too busy studying for their exams. They want to make good grades so they, so they can get a real good job, so that they can live in the right neighborhood, so they can drive the right car, so they can live in the right home. And so they're so busy studying and preparing for their future, they just don't have any time from Jesus for Jesus. They know that if Jesus comes in, he'll want to talk to them. He'll want to spend time with them. He'll want to walk with them. He'll want to rearrange their schedule. And they don't have time for that kind of disruption. And they, so they tell Jesus, I just don't have time. I just don't have room for you right now. I'm just too busy. Some people are so busy partying with their friends, they just don't have time to devote to building a relationship with Jesus. That would mean that they might have to turn off the television. They might have to cancel Netflix. They might have to put down the magazines. They might have to skip a few parties because when Jesus comes in, he's going to try and tell them what to do. He's going to try and tell them how to spend their time, and they don't have time for that. They don't have room for Jesus in their life. They're too busy building their relationship with their boyfriends or girlfriends. They don't have time for Jesus. They want to make sure that they have a strong relationship with that special person, their children, their wives, whatever. And so that, that time with Jesus will take away time that they want to spend with them. They know Jesus will want to tell you how to act. And you ain't got time for that. Some people have too much junk in their homes. Their homes are so cluttered with junk, there's just no room for Jesus in their house. If Jesus comes in, he might want you to get rid of some of your precious stuff. They might have to get rid of the television. They might have to throw out the, out the radio. They might have to burn some of their videos. They might have to get rid of some of the stuff in their food. He's going to be looking in your food, looking in your cabinet. You don't want Jesus doing that. If you say, Jesus, I don't have room for you in my house. They just don't have room enough in their hearts in their homes, in their lives for Jesus. They know that if Jesus comes in, he'll bring all kinds of things with them. He'll disrupt their lives. There's just no room for junk for Jesus in their life because they don't want to get rid of the junk in the house. Because when Jesus comes in, he cleans you out. And that stuff you hold precious, he throws away. You want to make somebody mad? Oh, my goodness, you clean up their, their stuff. Me and my wife, we, we, we have our disagreements, but the hardest ones, when she bothers my stuff, leave my stuff alone. So, so many people, their lives are so crowded. They just don't have time for Jesus. In fact, they tell Jesus, Jesus, you understand, I need a good job. I, I need to catch a good man. I need to catch a good woman. You, you know, Jesus, you can come back, maybe if you come back after I retire. Maybe if you come back after I get my, get my job. Maybe if you come back after I graduate. But right now, I just don't have time for you. See, Jesus, look at my calendar. I don't have any space on my calendar for you. I'm too busy for you. So sadly, 
they told Mary and Joseph, I'm sorry, but there's just no room for Jesus in here. Maybe if you come back next week, my life will be less hectic, and maybe I can find a little room for him then. For a lot of people, that's the situation we find ourselves in. Our lives, our homes, our, our jobs, they crowd us in, and we just don't have room for Jesus. We fill our lives with everything else but Jesus. And that, that all those things we fill in, they take up every nook, every cranny of our lives, and there's just no room for Jesus. We tell Jesus, we'll gladly let you in if you come back later. But right now, we just don't have room for you. See, so many of us are so busy trying to get that American dream that we're going to miss out on heaven. God knows what you need. He's already prepared it for you. All he wants you to do is open the door and let Jesus in. You see, church, Mary and Joseph were about to have a baby. And if you've never had a baby in your house, I'm telling you, it changes everything. I can remember before Brianna was born, I used to spend long hours staying up just reading and studying and doing what I wanted to do. When Brianna came in, she changed everything. Both me and Veronica had to rearrange our schedule around our daughter. Then we added Sarah. Even today, I, 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 y'all know I come, I go late everywhere because I'm always waiting for my babies. You know, when you have a kid, a kid takes over your life. And they don't want Jesus to come in because they know that Jesus is going to take over their life. When you have a baby, babies get jealous real easy. When you sit there looking at the TV or you sit there reading, the baby says, hmm, they're not paying attention to me. I'm going to go nag them. And that's what they do. When you, are, when, when, if you ever take your attention off the baby, the baby will find you, and the baby will say, you're doing something that, 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 that does not involve me. You've got, you're spending time, and it's not on me, so I want that time. And it'll disrupt your life. But that's how Jesus is. Jesus comes, and anything you do, that takes your focus off of him, he will nag you until you put your focus back on him. Now, the reason he does that is because he wants you to remember that he, he has you. He knows what you need. That's why in Matthew 6, 31 through 37, it says, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus deals with the problem of overcrowding. There are so many people who are so busy that they feel they just don't have any time or any room for Jesus. They're worrying about tomorrow because they forgot Jesus is already taking care of next year. See, they can't have family worship because they're just too busy. They can't come to prayer meeting because they're just too busy. They can't come to Sabbath school because they're so tired from working five and six jobs. So when it, times come, when it, when it comes to Jesus, they just don't have time. They just don't have room for him in their lives. So they put up the sign when Jesus appears, no vacancies. I don't have room for Jesus in here. Church, our priority must be God. Anything you put ahead of God is your God. When your job is more important than your relationship with God, it has become your job. When your education is more important than, than your relationship with God, then your education is your God. When your friends are more important than God, they are your God. When your family is more important than God, then now your family is your God. The problem with these innkeepers was their lives were so crowded, they just did not have room for Jesus. 
In essence, they were saying, I don't have room for a savior. The second reason Jesus could not get into the inn was because Mary and Joseph were not recognized. Now, I'm going to step on a few toes, so put your feet out. I can just imagine those innkeepers looking out the window saying, who in the world do they think they are riding up here on that Toyota donkey? Can't they see our parking lot? We got Teslas, we got Lexus, we got Mercedes, we got Cadillac, we got Infinity, we got BMW. Don't park that Toyota in my parking lot. Those innkeepers didn't know Joseph. Who was Joseph walking up there, walking up there with this $85 men's warehouse suit on? Mary, you're looking at her feet. Her feet got painless shoes on. Joseph's hands are scarred and bruised. You can tell he's a laborer. You can look at his shoes and say, man, those are the shoes I threw out last week. They don't recognize them. They're just poor people. Mary is not dressed in fine clothes. Her dress still has a Walmart tag on it, saying, look out for falling prices. Her purse looked like she bought it at a swap meet. They can't see the label, but they know there's no such thing as Lewis Batten. So they don't recognize Mary and Joseph as being important. They don't recognize the special heritage that they have. And so when Mary and Joseph come up to the door, these are just two nobodies coming to their end. Ellen White says that they went up and down the major thoroughfares of Bethlehem knocking on doors, but because they were not recognized, they were not allowed in. I've done a fair amount of traveling in my life. I can tell you that there are times when, when, when you have been traveling and I'm so tired that there's nothing better than when I get to the hotel. But I'm telling you one of the worst experiences ever is when you book a hotel room, you get to the hotel and they say, I'm sorry, Mr. Bartley, but we don't have your reservation. I've been there where you step back and watch guests after guests come in. They say, oh, we have one more room. Oh, we have one more room. But see, you're not important enough. I have a friend who manages a hotel. He told me that at the nice hotels, they keep one room open just in case the president or the king or the Davises <laughs> come by. <laughs> and they only give that room up if someone's important. See, innkeepers are just like us. They want to make sure they that those rooms were golden during that period. It, they weren't just going to give it up to a nobody. They were going to give it up to someone who was going to come back, someone who's going to bring some business, someone that was going to help them. They said, I don't have room for no poor people riding up here in a Toyota donkey. They're not going to be able to help me. And the sad thing is the person who could have helped them the most is the one they turned away. They were waiting for someone to come along who was more honest, somebody more favored, somebody who had a better reputation. Who has a better reputation than Jesus? And so they turned Jesus away because they didn't recognize him. The only says Joseph and Mary possessed little of the earth's riches but they had the love of God and this made them rich in contentment and peace. They were children of the heavenly king who was about to give them a wonderful honor. Angels had been watching them while they were on their journey and when night came and they went to rest, they were not left alone. Angels were still with them. You see, church, it's the people we pass by who often have the most Christ in them. It's the people we walk over we walk past. Those are the people who are important to God. I can only imagine the strain and pressure that Joseph must have gone, been under as he goes from door to door, frantically knocking on doors, trying to get a comfortable place for his pregnant wife and child to be born. I'm sure Mary must have been experiencing 
her labor pains by then. And as Joseph is frantically searching for some place to, to sleep, I know she probably was applying that gentle womanly pressure with the sweetest voice you probably ever heard. Now, I'm no expert at childbirth, but it was my privilege to be in the room when both of my daughters were born. They hooked my wife up to a monitor, and I remember it, as the contractions get worse, more lights come on. Protect me when I go home, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you, women change during childbirth. It's good to be in the room, and it's not good to be in the room. <laughs> Now, the pain is so terrible. And my wife had all kinds of medicine to block the pain, and yet the pain was still there. And see, then they direct the pain at the person closest to them. And see, the doctors have figured it out. That's why they tell you, hold your wife's hand. Come on. <laughs> I'm going to be in real trouble now. <laughs> gets more and more intense. They get closer and closer to those words that they drop in the baptismal pool. But they don't get them. And they're so loving. They always love them. <laughs> I'm going to be in trouble now. <laughs> and I can just imagine as that pain was gripping her, she's saying, Joseph, you got to find some place for me. Because she's suffering, because she's about to give birth, and there's no pain quite like that pain. And I can just imagine her saying in that sweet voice, honey, we got to find something. Joseph, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking. Nope, I ain't say look. <laughs> you got to find something. You know, so many times, People walk past Jesus and they don't even recognize him. The car that barely missed you on the highway, that was Jesus. The test that you took at the doctor's office that came back negative, that was Jesus. Your eyes opening up this morning and you're being able to see, that's Jesus. That old piece of junk that started again, that's running on nothing, that's Jesus. That exam you passed, even though you know you didn't study, that's Jesus. Those lights that are still on in your house, even though you know you ain't paid the light bill, that's Jesus. All those blessings floating around us every day, every way. And people are saying, man, I can't wait to hit the lottery. You hit the lottery when you woke up. We often stand in a clump of trees asking God, God, where's that forest? We pass by Jesus every day and we don't even recognize him because we're so busy, because we're looking for something important, because we're looking for someone important. So many good people, that, that, so many people pass by that day, the innkeepers, they didn't even recognize Jesus, the greatest person in the world. Those innkeepers were like so many of us. They were looking at the package instead of the gift. So many people get hooked up on the exteriors and they forget that God is looking at hearts. We're judging people by the exterior package, never taking time to look at their hearts. Joseph and Mary looked poor. They were just two poor people riding up on this Toyota donkey. No one thought that they could be carrying a king because their clothes were torn, because their clothes were old. They had no idea that they were carrying the Savior. You know, somebody pulls up in a certain type of car, and we look at him and say, man, I can tell he has money. Another person pulls up in another type of car and say, I can tell he's broke. You know, sometimes we judge people based upon what we see, and we have no idea what the real story is. That person with the nice car could have stole it. Or he could just be borrowing it. And the person with the tore down car, he could just be boring now. Jesus warns us that he came not to save healthy people, 
but to save sick people. He came as a doctor. See, if you're fine, you don't go to the doctor. You go to the doctor because you're sick. All of us are here because we're sick. Jesus said, I came to help the sick. See, if you don't feel that you're sick, you won't be here. The problem is we're all sick. And the worst thing is if you're sick and don't know you're sick. Jesus deals with the people who get hung up on the exterior, exteriors. So often we look at good people, at, look at people as good because we're looking at the wrapping paper and we forget about the gift. If I were to take a cup that was filthy on the outside, say you were really thirsty and I got a cup that was filthy on the outside but was clean on the inside, you drink the water. But if I got you a cup that was clean on the outside, but filthy on the inside, you wouldn't drink that. See, sometimes we, we get so caught up in looking at the outside, we forget about the inside. Jesus is more interested in what is on the inside because it's the things on the inside that tear up the things on the outside. It's the things on the inside that make you say the things you do, that make you see the things you see, that makes you do the things you do. It's not the things on the outside. Jesus wants to clean up our hearts. Putting on a nice dress and fixing your hair up and doing all those good things, even putting on a nice suit, that's not going to cover a bad character. If your heart is dirty, no matter how clean you look, you're still not clean. So often in our church, we get bogged down on who looks like this and who looks like that. We judge people based on their education, judge people based on the way they live, judge people based on how, how they drive, what they drive, all that other stuff. We judge people when God is judging just on your heart. There is nobody above you. There's nobody beneath you. God is the one who's special, not us. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said that when he comes back, he's going to just ask a simple question. When I was sick, did you visit me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was locked in prison, did you come by? That's all I want to know. All that other stuff is not important to me. If you're trying to be someone, be someone to be recognized by someone, you'll never be anyone. One more time, if you're trying to be someone, to be recognized by someone, you'll never be anyone. God measures people from the ground up. Everyone was viewed the same in God's eyes. We're all sinners who are saved by grace. All those innkeepers miss God because they were looking for a dressed up man. They were so caught up on seeing a rich leader, they missed a humble savior. After a long, tiring day of walking up and down the streets of that city, looking for lodging, Joseph finally comes to a friendly innkeeper. He notices Mary's predicament. After giving them the same story that they'd heard over and over again, he takes a little pity on them. And he says, look, I don't have any rooms in my inn, but there's a barn in the back, and you're welcome to use it. Now, that barn didn't have HBO, didn't have room service. There were no bagmen to take their bags. All it came with was a few animals and some straw. From that simple barn, Jesus painted a beautiful picture, Mary, Joseph, Jesus, and the animals. You see, church, it was not a, what was on the outside of the barn. It was what was on the inside. The last reason that the people had no room for Jesus was because it was all about the animals. Ellen White says here, the savior of the world is born. The majesty of glory who filled all heaven with admiration and splendor is humiliated to a bed in a manger. In heaven, he was surrounded by holy angels, but now his companions are the beasts of the stall. What humiliation this is. Wonder, O oh heaven, and be ashamed, O oh earth. But see, for Christ, 
It was all about the animals. He didn't need anybody to confirm who he was. He knew who he was. Angels and animals joined together to welcome the king of the universe to our world. Imagine the king of the universe. The first thing he saw was animals. The first thing he smelled was a barn. I can tell you through empirical evidence that there is nothing that smells good in a barn. People who work or live near barns get that barnyard smell on them. And it's like trying to wash out gasoline. You can't wash that smell off. It stays with you if you've been working in a barnyard. Right there in that dirty, stinking barn, God painted a beautiful picture because man was too busy. Man didn't have room for him. Man didn't recognize him. But God said, since y'all don't have time, since y'all don't have room, I'll make it about the animals. I'm about to close now. The irony is that even though the people who were crowded in that Hilton in that Sheraton, in that Four Seasons, thought that they were all being blessed, that they were having a great time. The only people who was really blessed that night were the animals and Mary and Joseph. See, they thought they were living it up, room service, HBO, all kinds of nice seats and all that stuff, but the real blessing wasn't in the hair in the Sheraton. The real blessing wasn't in the Hilton. The real blessing was in that little farm with those animals. So often we look at the world and look at the stars, look at the football players, look at the athletes, look at the actors, and we think, wow, they just living it up. All we do is come to church. All we do is pray. All we do is read the Bible. And it looks like they're having a great time, but the real blessing is not in Hollywood. The real blessing is at 106 Salute Day and Road because that's where God is. And where God is, that's where your blessing is. My prayer for this church in 2023 is that all of us make room for Jesus in our lives.